This material is made available to you by or on behalf of the University of Melbourne under Section 113P of the Copyright Act 1968. It may be subject to copyright. For more information, visit the University Copyright website. Good evening everyone and thank you for joining us. My name is Julie Willis and I'm the Dean of the Faculty of Architecture, Building and Planning. Firstly, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the unceded lands in which we work, learn and live, the Wurundjeri Woiwurrung and Bunurong peoples. We pay respects to Elders past, present and future and acknowledge the importance of Indigenous knowledge in the Academy. Tonight we present the first of the Dean's Lecture Series for 2023, Bauwander Architecture for the, in the Climatic Turn, with guest lecturer Matthias Sauerbrook. But first, I'm very pleased to welcome a special guest tonight, Phil White, who is General Manager of Dulux Acrotex, and you, who you will hear from in just a second. Phil has a long involvement with Dulux and their support of the university and particularly with Dulux's support of emerging architects through the AIA Dulux Study Tour is so important for the profession and future students. Phil, I'd like to invite you up to speak for a few minutes. Okay, well, thank you very much for having us. Um, 
Uh, long association with Dulux. This is my 30th year um, at, at Dulux. Um, I remember my first project uh, was in New Zealand. It was a refurbishment, refurbishment of the uh, Parliament buildings uh, in Wellington, which had been severely damaged by fire. And the, uh, the, the main architects were Warren and Marnie um, from New Zealand. But there was a conservational architect called Howard Tanner. Uh, from Tanner, Tanner Architects in Sydney, which are now uh, TKD. Um, and he was responsible for ensuring that the, uh, the colours conform with the heritage overlay on, on the building. Um, I'm sure many of you will be familiar with, uh, with Howard and his achievements. But Howard was re relentless um, in ensuring that the, uh, the detail was correct. And uh, an example I would give, uh, the debating chamber in, in the parliament buildings was a it was a room not, not too dissimilar to this, but he made us paint up in the top right-hand corner, and then he would get us to shine a spotlight about 70 meters away just to get the detail right and the color right, and then he would fly back to Sydney and then come back a month later and make sure it was okay. Um, so it was the, the, what that did for me, the project laid the foundation of the importance of the detail of architecture. Uh, and the depth of knowledge and research that goes into a project and, and started my love of architecture as well. Uh, as Julie mentioned, over, over many years, uh, Gilux uh, has supported the Australian Institute of Architects and the Melbourne Design School, um, because we like to think we understand the, the importance uh, of the built environment and, and the role that architecture plays in that. And if we can support them, we, then we can. Um, we, we do run programs like the Geolux Study Tour. Um, it's in its six, uh, 16th year this year, the Geolux Study Tour. Um, and it's, uh, the, the program um, invites the, 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 the five brightest young architects selected by the AIA to go on a, on a, on a study tour. Um, this year we'll visit Helsinki, Lisbon, Zurich, um, and fin finish up at the Venice Biennale. Um, and the aim of assisting uh, the education of some of these, these bright young architects who will also become um, part of the, uh, uh, the Geolux Study uh, uh, alumni. Um, we've been a supporter of the Melbourne uh, School of Design uh, since 2013 when we agreed with Tom Cavan uh, to partner in, in the Geolux Gallery uh, to provide an exhibition space uh, for this, this wonderful facility. And we also have other links with, uh, with the university. Um, uh, our CEO, Patrick Houlihan, um, as a chemist um, by profession, uh, is also an, a part of the alumni of Melbourne University. Um, but of course, we, tonight we welcome Matthias. We're not here to talk about Gulex, we're here to talk about Matthias. Um, uh, and from what I've seen of, 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 of uh, Matthias' work and the practice work, um, very innovative, innovative with the use of color which always makes us happy and it gives us a role in architecture. So uh, we'd, we, uh, we'd, we feel truly privileged to be part of the event tonight and thank you for, for having us. So now it's my great pleasure to introduce our presenter for this evening. Matthias Saarbrück is an architect and together with Louisa Hutton, the founding partner of Saarbrück Hutton, an award-winning architecture studio based in Berlin. Notable projects by the studio include the award-winning GSW headquarters in Berlin, the Brandhorst Museum in Munich, and the more recent M9 Museum District in Venice Mest. The studio received the Eric Schelling Prize for Architecture in 1998, the Fritz Schumacher Prize for Architecture in 2003, the Premier de Honor International de Castillo y Leon in 2010, and the Gottfried Semper Preuss in 2013. They received the German Architecture Award in 2015 for the Emmanuel Church in Cologne. The work of the design studio has long been recognised for an engagement with sustainability and the use of vibrant colours and pattern facades as part of their architectural language. Matthias studied at the Hochschule der Kunst Berlin and the Architectural Association of School of Architecture, where he subsequently also taught. He has held tenured positions in, at TU Berlin and the Academy of Fine Arts Stuttgart, as well as visiting professorships in the United States and Berlin. He's a founding member of the German Sustainable Building Council and the Urban Design Council in Munich, director of architecture at the Academy der Kunst and an honorary fellow of the American Institute of Architects. His lecture today 
will use examples from his diverse design portfolio to propose the emergence of a weak modernity that is trying to adequately respond to the rapidly changing environmental and social context in today's European cities. Please welcome Matthias Sarra. Thank you very much. Um, does the speaker work? Yes, it does. No? Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dean Willis, for, um, first of all, um, the invitation to come here. I'm very honored, and thank you for your kind introduction. Also, of course, thank you very much for Dulux to make this possible. Uh, and thank you for the school to host me um, so generously, uh, the school represented by Donald Bates, who has been looking after me like my mother for the last three days. <laughs> um, so uh, I have quite a, a kind of lengthy talk. Uh, uh, prepare yourself um, uh, on a difficult subject. Um, and it's <clears throat> the hypothesis, in a way, or the starting point of my train of thought is that we might be in a situation today in 2023 as our architect colleagues were in 1923 when they were trying to understand and react to and also embody and express um, the, the phenomena of that time, such as the industrialization of mechanization of almost everything, the appearance of cinema, medialization, social movements, um, and, and, and political beliefs, and so on and so forth. And they were sort of coming up with a particular um, type of architecture, which we today recognize as heroically modern. Um, and similarly, um, today, in, in 2023, we are facing a number of um, factors, a number of, let's say, qualities, quantities um, that uh, it seems architecture has to respond to. And it seems as though much as in the, um, 19, in the 20th century, the beginning of the 21st century, it might, these occurrences might call for a different type of architectural strategy, architectural thinking, and in the end, also architectural aesthetic. Um, and I'm going to um, use as sort of benchmark or kind of source material, if you like, two um, sort of ask major publications um, that we were doing the last years. Uh, one is a, um, a retrospective, if you like, exhibition um, in a museum that we've designed ourselves. Um, Julie just mentioned it. It's the Mestre M. Nove uh, Museum in, on the mainland of Venice. And the other thing um, is, was a, a, a German architectural magazine, Baumeister, who um, asked us to curate an issue for them. They do this once a year. Um, and um, choices of subject and so on was ours. And we decided that we wanted to dedicate that um, issue to what we call the aesthetics of the Bauwende. Bauwende is a German word. It, Wende means turn, basically, and Bau is building. So it's the turn of building, uh, maybe adequately translated into climatic turn. Um, <coughs> the, the title of the exhibition was Draw Love Build. Um, and those three uh, terms, in a way, were metaphors for what we have engaged in over the last um, 30 years. Draw, I mean, literally drawing, of course, is one of our passions. And we started off before um, computers became standard. We were drawing a lot by hand um, and also with the brush and all sorts of techniques. Uh, and we see drawing today as a metaphor of conceptualizing, because the, the fact that the, the activity of drawing, of making marks on paper, is in a way a kind of try of money, try, an attempt to manifest your, your thought, your, your, whatever is kind of going on in your head, and, and the kind of uh, dialogue between this piece of paper, what you kind of put down, and what you thought it should be, and you, you kind of, uh, your kind of whole mental background is actually what leads to the concepts that um, we, uh, we put at the basis of our projects. Uh, and as most of these projects are located in an urban context in the widest sense, um, I'll come back to this, um, <coughs> it's, it's also conceptualizing the context of our architecture, conceptualizing the city. Build, uh, sorry, draw love, build. Love, 
I mean, if you don't love architecture, you better not get involved because it, it, does, it does need a lot of passion and it needs perseverance, as you all know. Um, and, but love also became a, a, a metaphor for the, um, the need and the also intent to think ahead for future generations. As you know, the average uh, life cycle of a building we calculate as 60 years is sometimes a little bit idealistic. We have also been involved with buildings that were supposed to be demolished after 30 years. But then there are also buildings that survive for 120, 150 years. So I mean, these are, ti these are uh, time spans which exceed um, uh, a life of, of a generation or kind of even an individual in any case. And therefore, <coughs> we really have to not just think of the reaction of today's condition, but we sort of have to think ahead, and that obviously is the kind of basis of uh, sustainability. And the third term, finally, build, is what we all want to do and all love doing, um, and it's really to do with the physical presence of actual materials, of actual walls, floors, ceilings, spaces, and so on and so forth. So <coughs> uh, it, for, for us, it stands um, as a metaphor for the importance of uh, sensual perception and also um, se attention to sensual perception, perception in, what we, um, in what we design and do. So the exhibition, <coughs> that's a sort of side subject. I mean, you know architectural exhibitions are really terrible and difficult because you're talking about something that's not there. I mean, you, you just have to represent buildings or whatever. Um, that's somewhere in the world and you bring, come along with photographs and texts and, and films and whatnot. And there's always this, this kind of dilemma. Am I going to do a kind of walk-in catalog which has lots of text and you have to spend hours reading it all, which nobody does, by the way? Or do I do something which resembles more like an art exhibition and I have nice drawings and beautiful models and so on and so forth? Well, we tried to seek a compromise in that we made the art exhibition in inverted commas. It's a, uh, a show of, um, well, it was about 50 projects, uh, all represented through models and conceptual drawings. I mean, there was no drawing, no parallel projection or very little of it. There was no drawings which intended to um, you know, instruct any workmen or whatever people to how they were meant to build it. But there were drawings which were sort of trying to catch the spirit, the concept, the kind of location, the, the, the way you use it or perceive a building and so on and so forth. So these <coughs> added up to something which was like a little bit like an art exhibition. But in addition, um, we uh, designed a, an app which you can actually still download today if you want to. It's called Draw Love Build. And uh, uh, for every project that was represented in the, uh, on the gallery floor, there's a kind of little uh, if you like, stash of material where you can find a written description, sometimes a little movie, uh, photographs, um, uh, and other kind of materials if, you, if you're if interested in all of this. So you can sit down if you want to. There are armchairs everywhere, and you can um, study things in uh, more detail. There was also an uh, explanation by the curator the, in Italian, and so it's obviously bilingual and so on. So that's one thing, and it really <clears throat> is a sort of, if you like, repertoire, it's a sort of, or reservoir of, of our past experiences, which I'm kind, kind of trying to draw into this uh, search of a um, adequate architecture. And the other thing is this uh, issue, as I said, and that we started, well, I mean, I don't need to repeat this, I presume, to an audience of architects that um, we have a big problem. Uh, and that uh, all those targets that we set ourselves or have set ourselves, the European Union has set itself and so on and so forth, are not being met. Um, carbon dioxide, climate change, basically carbon dioxide, the slow uh, heating up of uh, the earth, we all kind of experience it now. We, we've known it for 50 years. Um, we haven't done very much about it, as much talk, but not so much activity. And we are actually, and you can see this here, we, see, we are at this point here at the moment, where this curve of these are the emissions should really come rapidly down. And if you look at this chart, uh, that indicates 
uh, and of uh, all emissions, this is for Germany or Europe, um, come from the building sector, and it's probably this is probably a kind of slightly positive uh, number in this not including uh, industrial processes uh, that also are needed to produce Dulux paint, for example, and any other building material, and also transport. That is obviously a factor in in uh, in any kind of product, any construction. So it's really between 38 to 50 percent, um, for which we as uh, profession, as people who are in the world of construction, are responsible and where we have a possibility to um, get involved. Um, and there's also n not just the kind of facts of uh, climate um, change and its uh, associated phenomena, which now today are very noticeable. Uh, there's also this question of equality and, and fairness within the world. This is from 2014, but it just hasn't really, it hasn't really changed. Um, uh, this is the this median you see here, is the is the um, indication of uh, the kind of uh, footprint that would be possible for every individual um, if the world, the planet, was to support uh, every inhabitant. And you can see this is now organized by nations. You can see that the half the world is below um, this uh, median and the other half is up and way up uh, above. And that really means that this, these are all the rich countries, industrialized countries and so on. They are living at the expense of the poor countries, the emerging countries. Uh, and <coughs> this, the thought that the, the rich countries should be paying for the damage that the uh, poor countries are um, experiencing now has already been uh, vented, uh, justifiably so, and obviously the, the kind of conflict that might be arising uh, out of this uh, in inequality is monumental, has um, really serious um, consequences. And to top all of this, <coughs> there was a, a lawsuit in, in Germany where some young people, uh, aged, I don't know what, 19 or so, um, took the state to court. Um, and they, their, their claim was that um, the state was not fulfilling the constitution in that it was not looking after the, um, after the, uh, the protection of future generations. That's an article in our constitution. And <clears throat> they were arguing that uh, although targets have been set, um, they're not being met and that the legislators are not really putting serious efforts into trying to achieve that kind of rapid change of carbon emissions and the associated use of fossil fuels and so on and so forth um, as they should be. And the highest court in Germany gave, uh, agreed with this case and they basically condemned the government to take action. <coughs> so theoretically, the German government should be extremely proactive, but and as a matter of fact, it's a whole, it's a, as everywhere else, it's a kind of relatively slow affair. So, okay, that's the starting point. <clears throat> and now the question is, what does it mean for architecture? And to kind of approach that question, we made a call for projects in, in our office, and we asked everybody to choose, I don't know, five to 10 or so projects that they heard of, they know, they've seen, they read, this whatever found in the internet or uh, in books or whatever, and make a photocopy of it. And we had a very long corridor in our office, which was covered from top to bottom in um, projects. And we made a selection um, and started to organize them. And uh, ended up with, I think it's all nine or so kind of themes, which we felt uh, might be, um, might offer us a kind of way into this, um, into this subject. And so the first, we're going from large scale to small scale, the first question is this, um, is this idea of, of a context in the city. I mean, um, as opposed to Australia, uh, if you take the European map, uh, you'll find that it mostly looks similar to this plan of by the famous Leonardo Benevolo, who's written the history of the European city, um, uh, he's made, has made of the Veneto. Um, this is the Venice, the island, and that's the mainland of Venice. Uh, of Venice. And this, is, uh, this territory 
It's called Tre Pave in Italy. It's Treviso, uh, Padua, and uh, Venezia. And in that triangle, I think approximately 40 or so percent of the Italian GDP is being produced. So it's like a, it's more like Los Angeles or like the Ruhrgebiet or like Holland or something like that. In in as is and the kind of all the images that we have in our the back of our minds when we think of the North Italian city with the piazza and the Duomo and everything else is kind of like. Uh, cliches of the past which don't really reflect the reality um, of uh, urban conditions. As a matter of fact, in, if you take Venice as a kind of tourist hotspot, um, there's only 50,000 or actually less than 50,000 um, Venetians who still live on the island um, and 250,000 are li living on the mainland. Uh, partially because the mainland is incredibly well connected. It has a very uh, powerful, good airport. Um, there are several high-speed train lines uh, that run in all directions. There are several motorways which are coming down there uh, that run in all directions. And there is a kind of very, uh, it's even a, there's a system of canals which you just about can recognize here. Um, that's a historic way of moving goods um, through this landscape. So it really is a a landscape of infrastructure, if you like. And this landscape of infrastructure obviously stretches out in one or the other way across the whole of Europe. I mean, you have, uh, uh, of course, traffic that is um, connecting everything with everything, um, but in increasingly also, and this is something that will be increasing with, uh, uh, with the need for renewable energies, uh, the production and distribution of energy will become much more visible. Will, as a matter of fact, in certain regions of Germany, for example, almost everywhere looks like this. I mean, you get a lot of uh, power, wind power, and of course, interventions for solar uh, and also hydropower uh, leave big marks on the landscape. Uh, but also, <coughs> uh, social infrastructures such as uh, the infrastructure for tourism, for example, uh, affects the urban, what I would call urban environment, you could call it city, cityscape or whatever, um, uh, a great deal. And we have to get used to the idea that we have to place, when, when we place our buildings, we have to place them within these kind of uh, infrastructure situations. Um, trying to connect the scale of the fast train and the kind of high-speed motorway uh, with the kind of individual and the kind of pedestrian or the bicyclist who is kind of uh, using this kind of spot for whatever. So this is a, a project of a, uh, it's actually a civic building in Hamburg and you can just see down here there's a kind of major train line running past it with a lot of noise and so on. And so there's a building which um, changes its face, a sort of Janus situation if you like. Uh, here it's kind of showing its back because of sound projection and uh, and, and ventilation going the other direction and so on. And here it's opening up to a kind of, sort of mini park and a pedestrian situation. Um, <clears throat> so similar, uh, similar kind of conditions uh, are almost part of every project that we do. And uh, I would like, just like to point, pick out this kind of museum that's been mentioned already twice. Um, in, uh, in Mestre, it's a, well, Mestre has always been the back door of Venice, if you like, the kind of, uh, uh, you know, until 1920, the bridge didn't exist and the trains didn't go all across uh, into, uh, onto the island and everything that had to be brought and, uh, to Venice, I mean, to the island, had to be brought by ship. And uh, there was a uh, location just off the picture here called Piazza Barche, which is like a little harbor where everything was loaded from carts onto uh, boats and, uh, and then transported across. So Mestre is really the, the kind of the service, if you like, hub for, um, for the island, which used to be incredibly powerful. But Mestre was always very modest in scale. Uh, <clears throat> and um, it, this is the center. This is, this is the dome, if you compare that to the St. Mark's Dome in Venice. It's obviously very kind of modest affair, that's the central square here. And this area here was uh, closed off because there's a little monastery um, uh, 
which uh, was secular, secularized in Napoleonic times and then used from then on by military in the end by Italian military. And they abandoned the buildings, also these buildings here, and they were all kind of about to fall apart. Um, and the whole area, but the whole area was closed off because of its military use. So <coughs> the, um, this was a competition actually that we won um, uh, about 10 years ago. And uh, the proposition is actually to make infrastructure, if you like, pedestrian infrastructure, kind of make a diagonal connection through the site and open it up for the public and then provide a museum that was the, the brief of the uh, competition, a museum of the 20th century, the history of the 20th century in Italy, uh, which also has a, a, a space for um, uh, changing exhibitions and what you saw, the, the kind of shots from the, from our exhibition were actually in that space. Um, <coughs> and, and I mean, there are various other buildings here, which we, um, some of which were supporting the whole affair financially and so on, which we renovated. And uh, the, the monastery was a kind of major affair because it was in such bad uh, conditions. But it is one of those kind of conceptual drawings, which is trying to say really that we were trying to not just make a connection, but we were trying to offer facility, amenity, if you like, uh, along these routes, if you kind of uh, walk through here. Um, the, the museum has all of its public facilities on the ground floor. There's a restaurant, there's a mediatek, there's a, a little shop, and there's most importantly, um, there's a, a lecture hall. You can see this is the, that's the pavement outside, and you can sort of see in, and you can also look out and see people walking by. So it's meant to be, make an offering to the city and um, invite social um, interchange, if you like, social exchange in, um, in the public realm. I mean, the, the, particularly the idea of the Italian uh, city was always there's the piazza, and on the piazza everything's like the forum or the agora. Everything's happening there. There's politics, there's trade, there's kind of social exchange. There's, you know, the whole city is like theater in a way, is meeting there. But of course, this idea is disappearing more and more. Uh, trade is, is kind of diminished through online uh, um, uh, shopping. Uh, the uh, Mestre, like any other kind of city, has huge shopping centers on the outside of where everybody goes by car. So nobody comes to walk um, uh, to do their shopping. There's still a very nice market, but that's only two days a, a week, and so on. I mean, uh, the city is kind of falling apart, if you like. It's emptying out from inside. And whenever we have the opportunity to kind of inter intervene with anything, I mean, we must make sure that we create situations which enable social exchange, which kind of enable a kind of community to grow. I mean, Mester is again an interesting case because it's hugely diverse. <coughs> There's a lot of uh, illegal immigration into Venice because most of the gastronomy is working with immigrants and, um, and they mostly live in Mestre. And so if you go into the market, you'll find every, every possible uh, uh, nation, language, uh, in all sorts of formations. And so for these kind of, for this sort of mixed community to have um, locations where things can happen, like here's a sort of children's uh, party or whatever, uh, and then there's a, a weekend market and so on and so forth, um, is incredibly uh, important. And to create, <coughs> to integrate into the existing fabric, kind of understand the logic that is there, but at the same time create noticeable uh, uh, situations, noticeable spaces, is probably uh, one of those important things because the city is all we have. I mean, the city is the place where we live, the city is where um, young children grow up, the city is where we die, and whatever the city offers to us kind of makes up the horizon of our perception, the horizon of our experience, and uh, we as architects have really an, a, a, a a duty um, to work on this kind of uh, richness um, that the city can offer. And here there are some uh, examples from our collection. That's the Kulturhuset in, in Stockholm, which has this fantastic square in front of which it, it goes straight into the ground floor. This was the model for the Pompidou Center, which you see at the top right. Um, <coughs> and uh, another example from Sao Paulo, uh, Lina Bubadis, 
museum that's lifted off in order to make a covered space below that um, you know is being used for all sorts of things like a, a kind of flea market but also political demonstrations and uh, art uh, performances and 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 uh, and on the right is um, the snow hatter opera in um, Oslo where the roof is turning into a public square so <coughs> uh, one project on a slightly larger scale that we are involved in at the moment is uh, also kind of trying to uh, create benefit, um, not just in social and uh, sort of cultural terms, but also um, in terms of the ecology, if you like, of the city. It's a, it's a fairground in Thessaloniki on a site which is right in the middle um, of the city. There's the, the, the core of, there's like an Acropolis, that's the core of Thessaloniki is up here. And then this is the kind of medieval city, which has been done over many times, and that's a sort of 19th century extension. And there was always this sort of uh, gap, if you like, this later filled in with the university. It was first a, a cemetery, but now it's a university, a grand, a big university club. This, I think it's the largest in Greece. And, and then this kind of, uh, 100 years ago, this trade fair um, started to grow there. And today, <coughs> it's a rather chaotic uh, assemblage of different pavilions which were built at different times in different state of repair or disrepair and the uh, company who's operating this decided to ask architects for advice what to do with this um, and what we proposed and won with um, is actually a rationalization of all the facilities i.e. to kind of group um, instead of many, many small kind of pavilions to group them together into larger halls, which is also the kind of trade standard at the moment, uh, and to kind of concentrate everything uh, so as to, to kind of create more open ground, basically, and to introduce a, a, a park um, that is available um, for the general public. So all of this in the foreground here was kind of paved before, or mostly paved, um, and uh, uh, passages were made, kind of uh, foot connections to the university and so on, to the Acropolis above there. Um, and these halls, I mean, if, when there's a trade on, you, you're at a fair uh, going on, then you can ticket, the, you can close gates and so on, you can ticket the whole uh, ground. But when there's not, it's open and it's uh, uh, permeable and you can walk through and it can also be used for um, cultural events. So this is a big conference hall here which can be used for concerts and so on. And here's an existing museum which is also uh, has been so included into the composition. So um, obviously we have the whole program of um, sustainable op optimization in terms of energy. Um, there are, as you can see, huge roofs uh, which will be totally covered in uh, photovoltaic um, panels which will act as a power plant uh, and taking up some of the needs of the uh, of the exhibition, and um, we're collecting rainwater, which is becoming more and more important uh, in Europe. We have incredible droughts now, um, and um, and most importantly, uh, ground is being freed and um, made kind of uh, opened up again, so that uh, the biocapacity of this site um, can increase. Um, <clears throat> I, it's probably not the same in Australia, but as a matter of fact, if you count the amount of animals as, and species in general that are um, living in a city, you'd be surprised that it's, uh, the biocapacity in the city is higher than in the countryside. This is to do with the fact that the countryside is being used intensely uh, for agriculture and so on, and uh, the use of uh, pesticides like glyphosate, for example, which is being used uh, all over the place, leads to an extreme reduction of insects. Uh, and with the reduction of insects comes an in a reduction of birds. And with the reduction of birds comes a reduction of other animals and so on. So that <coughs> uh, today, um, you know that there's on a daily basis, 100 species or so are, are dying uh, globally, uh, disappearing. Um, uh, we are kind of concerned to kind of try and uh, stop this trend and stabilize um, the situation and creating uh, parks or um, vegetal surfaces in the city is one way 
towards that. And uh, of course, we all uh, know the, um, the example of the High Line in New York, where a former infrastructure, uh, a train infrastructure, is being uh, uh, fitted out as a as a park, which is extremely successful. People love it, and something like that, for example, and there's a similar situation in Essen, in in Duisburg here. The, uh, this former uh, coal mine and uh, cokery uh, has, been, has been changed into a fantastic park. Um, <clears throat> and even kind of taking vegetation into the buildings on top of roofs and in facades. The example here in Milano by Stefano Boeri, uh, where really uh, the whole building becomes like a, a plant. It's almost like a reverse action of um, this classical or neoclassical idea of the origin of architecture where trees are being tied together and to form a, a shelter and that's the sort of uh, the archetypal hut if you like um, we're today sort of almost reversing the process we're kind of starting with a sort of platonic cubes or uh, sort of geometric volumes and we're trying to uh, turn them back into into uh, quasi-natural um, sort of objects. I mean, there's also a question of uh, <clears throat> what's going to happen with streets. I mean, if traffic really is going to change as it should do, um, that it's uh, more electric and that it's uh, less um, engine driven, and that it's also being reduced um, to uh, more communal uh, ways of uh, uh, driving than theoretically, um, say half or so, uh, of the space of the street should be available, should become available for other things. I mean, street life might come back into our cities, um, and, uh, and I think that's a very exciting um, prospect, and I think a challenge for us as architects and landscape architects to think up something that might um, work. And we, as in our practice, we are experimenting for the first time now with actual green facades. Uh, this is a building that has just been finished, um, where we uh, for the first time really growing um, uh, surfaces, uh, green surfaces, uh, to uh, provide um, shade um, and also ambience and biotopes, as it were. It's a, it's a building that is kind of, it's an office building that is, I mean, you can see the facade facade is like inhabitable. I mean, it has different depths, so sometimes it's a balcony, sometimes it's a, a bay window, sometimes it's a part of the space, so it kind of steps forwards and backwards and creates all these kind of different situations with and without vegetation. Um, so these are, uh, it's kind of an interesting organization um, for which this building has been designed. They're very flexible in their work formations, so these are spaces to concentrate. And, uh, but I mean, there are very large areas. You can see here that all the red areas are more or less open, public, um, and uh, uh, are supposed to enable all sorts of informal um, uh, um, work activities, uh, communication that to do with the correspondence of the stairs. Um, uh, and uh, you can see here, um, it's, a, it's a kind of very it's a unorthodox, uh, I guess, way of um, working. Well, to kind of respond to the climate is no new idea. I mean, the, the, the battle cry of the modernist uh, was um, uh, in German, Licht, Luft, Sonne, uh, light, air, and sun. It was meant to be because um, uh, in cities like Berlin, for example, the dense uh, historic uh, quarters were breeding tuberculosis. People were uh, in, in bad um, shape, and these Siedlungen, these, these settlements were built outside of the city in order to bring children into the fresh air and into the sun and so on, and the sanatoria, like the one Sonnenstrahl at the top left by Duiker in Holland, were designed especially for people to take the sun. Um, uh, and uh, Casa Girasole in Italy, that's probably the most extreme example is a building on tracks, which is kind of rotating um, uh, 360 degrees in a day so that it's always uh, the inner side of the angle is always exposed um, to the sun. But I mean, it's an idea that's not, uh, that didn't come up in the 20th century. I mean, there are historic examples as well, which are creating greenhouse uh, type spaces. But I mean, of course, today, <coughs> it's more, the sun is more being seen as an enemy. Uh, 
we, we all know that uh, extreme exposure kind of causes uh, skin cancer and also the heat that is kind of very noticeable in the summer month is starting to become a problem for um, human uh, bodies. So uh, all, all, foot, all, all ways of, of shading, of kind of creating shade and facades that are flexible and uh, you know, provide this kind of protection are um, called for. And I mean, these are partially historic examples. You probably recognize um, Jean Nouvel's um, Institut du Monde Arabe, which is a little bit of an extreme example, but nevertheless, uh, and uh, La Caton Vassal's uh, renovation of um, residential building, 60s residential building, which are introducing a, a zone uh, that can also be used, a sort of winter garden zone, if you like. Um, <coughs> we, in several projects, I mean, we have been dealing with this issue. This is the GSW headquarters that um, Julie mentioned in the introduction. It has a, it's a, a building that has a, a double facade, which acts as a, a solar flue, which you can see here in an illus uh, illustration from the simulation. You can see how air heats up because the sun hits this um, surface, and there's quite a differential in temperature between top and bottom, and that makes air kind of rise up like in a chimney. And if you do that, you then can uh, draw air across. I mean, this was one of our first um, excursions into what we called low energy architecture at the time. And it created this uh, very specific facade, which for us was also an adequate expression of a piece of architecture that's actually responding to the climate, that is doing something. When the sun comes up, it's reacting. When the sun goes away, similarly, it's kind of opening itself up. Um, <clears throat> that it added, that it kind of, this solar flu creates the motor for the ventilation of the whole building, is so to say, a kind of um, uh, added kind of benefit. Um, and uh, to use convection, to use the differentiation of, or the differential of, of heat um, is, is not a new idea either. I mean, there's many uh, examples in, uh, heat, in hot climates, in desert climates, where the wind is being used. Um, these are wind catchers here, or also um, uh, kind of uh, airs being drawn through with additional solar flues that are um, uh, creating this um, uh, this uh, sort of situation. This is an example. Oops, an example um, by Zvi Hecker in Israel. It's a um, it's a city hall, and the air is being pulled through um, the interior uh, in order to create a continuous airflow. Which, even though the temperature is may not be different uh, between outside and inside, is because of the flow of the air is kind of subjectively feels cooler. Um, <coughs> We have other projects. I yesterday talked a little bit to some of you about this project. This is also using the wind. It's kind of uh, wind is being driven. You see the diagrams at the top. It's being driven through a double facade, creating a pressure-free fresh air that can be pulled into the offices without any draft and so on. So I mean, these, these kind of historic techniques um, can be studied, can be reintroduced, can be because we have all the simulation tools of the world these days, we can pretty much predict the performance. So uh, I invite you to, um, uh, to kind of try and avoid the kind of over mechanization that we have in uh, standards in our buildings, um, uh, particularly office buildings that can well operate with natural ventilation. So of course there are other phenomena of the, of the climate such as the rain. Um, this is the roof in Mestre, this kind of courtyard. Uh, you saw that before, which we are actually using as a uh, funnel, as it were. Uh, it collects rain, sorry. It collects rain, um, and uh, the rain is being put into a cistern that's sitting under the courtyard, and the, the water is used to clean and to water plants and so on and so forth. Um, <coughs> to make the water the rain, because it's becoming certainly in some regions becoming quite a, a valuable asset. It becomes like something quite special to make, create a, an architectural situation that when it does rain, kind of almost turns it into a theater is, is, a, kind of, uh, is a kind of thought that sort of comes back to, um, into our um, sort of awareness of uh, climate and reaction to climate. Now, um, <clears throat> to reduce uh, emission, 
we obviously have to rely to a much larger degree on renewable energies, which is free of emission. Uh, in other words, wind, geothermal, um, solar energies, and so on and so forth, can help a great deal to um, achieve those aims that we are trying to achieve. And of course, it's more efficient to, to make kind of central installations, um, large either what hydro dams or large kind of fields, as you saw earlier, of pre photovoltaic, photovoltaics or wind farms in the water, and so on and so forth. But I mean, every building, and as a matter of fact, in Germany, we now have a law that uh, requires of every building that it should have uh, photovoltaic panels on the roof. Every building can more or less cope with its own uh, demand, depending on its size, obviously. And this is uh, an early example where we are experimenting with various uh, forms of I mean, thermal uh, collectors and also uh, photovoltaics and so on. Um, and the most uh, efficient or effective and maybe also biggest is a kind of very large underground heat exchanger. Uh, Donald built the same thing in Federation Square. It's a, uh, the air is being pulled through the ground and in the winter it's being warmed up, pre-warmed for um, uh, the kind of internal ventilation of the offices. And in the, in the summer it's, it's picking up the, the cools of the earth and kind of provides very nice cooling without any kind of uh, mechanical uh, need. Um, so the integration of photovoltaics in um, uh, building envelopes is a big issue. It's a really difficult design task. Uh, I, I don't know many uh, very good examples, I have to admit. I mean, mostly they're sitting on the roof so that you don't see them. Um, and this is an inter interesting product, which is a sort of roof tile, which has a PV integrate into it. I'm not 100% sure how effective that is, but at least it's a kind of elegant uh, uh, product, I'd say. And if it worked, it would be fantastic. It's a project by Bjarke Ingels here in, uh, I think, in Cal Southern California. And this is a uh, project by uh, Christoph Ingenhofen. Uh, you can see these are more or less traditional PVs that are uh, int introduced in, into a kind of uh, seesaw type facade. Um, we are at the moment working on an, a high-rise building in, at Alexanderplatz, which was sort of central square in Berlin, a part of a cluster of high-rises. And in a way, this is like now um, 20 years or 25 years after GSW, and we're sort of asking ourselves what have we learned and what, uh, you know, what we do again, what do we not do again, and what we are um, proposing here is uh, also a certain degree of double skin, but it's not uh, double, double glazed. There's not two layers of glass, but it's just one uh, thermal break, if you like, um, in glass. And then there's a, a, another layer in front of that, which we call the kind of climate layer. And it's, uh, it allows for external sun shading, which is uh, quite fixed quite in a quite sturdy way. So it kind of operates in high wind uh, speeds as well, or higher wind speeds, and there's a kind of photovoltaic panel which uh, is uh, uh, contributing to the kind of electricity consumption of um, the building. Um, it's, uh, I mean, high rises is another question in itself. I mean, should we build high rises? Obviously, they are, uh, there's much more gray energy involved in, in the construction of a high rise, there's more uh, energy involved in operational, um, in the operation of buildings and so on. But we think, or I think that in particularly dense situations of which you have many here in the neighborhood in, um, in Melbourne, uh, it probably is a good idea as long as you really keep some of the ground open at the same time so that the, the kind of height in a way allows for some uh, green area, some uh, compensation in, um, in plant and uh, biocapacity. Um, <clears throat> we are also doing, have at various um, attempts to use wind um, energy. Uh, these were both buildings by the sea, this one in Copenhagen and that one in Oslo. Uh, both unfortunately did not come to realization. There's also 
I don't really know a, a, a project that is successfully doing this, I have to admit, because there seem, there seem to be all sorts of problems with kind of vibrations, and I don't know what. Um, uh, it's a combination of uh, wind, is, uh, wind generators are probably better placed off buildings. Um, <coughs> but um, one thing we learned in, in 30 years of, let's say, sustainable practice is also I like to illustrate with these um, diagrams. When we started, as I said, designed uh, the GSW building in 1990, um, this is the data that we were believing in. Um, and this, what this really says is that of the energy that is uh, being um, used in a lifetime of a building, 85% is in the operation and only 15% is in the construction. Um, and then, of course, um, as we and others kind of start, were starting to try and optimize uh, energy standards, optimize machinery, optimize kind of uh, the performance of, build, of everything, if you think of LED lighting, for example, or if you think of uh, heat recuperation in air conditioning systems and so on and so forth, this kind of consumption of the operative energy was going down and down and down, as a matter of fact, followed by a trail of legislation as far as Germany is concerned. And if you kind of see now, we have kind of almost have to, in order to get building permission, you almost have to reach our passive house standard. Um, <clears throat> but that meant, in terms of this, this um, uh, uh, assumption of, of energy consumption in the life cycle, that most of, the, um, most of the, these items were being reduced quite uh, drastically. And that if you then um, uh, look at the role of construction, which in itself has not been optimized or is not being optimized as much as um, all the kind of operative um, equipment, uh, construction becomes much more important. And that shifts in a way, uh, what we always say, the, the concentration from red energy, i.e. Of operative energy, into gray energy. And gray energy is what's being um, uh, invested at the beginning of a project, the materials that are being used to build something, and also what's happening at the end of a project. I mean, what do you do with those materials? I mean, when a building is being taken down, can you think of some kind of cyclical use? Um, can you recycle? Can you uh, find a new use for components, etc.? And this is something that was driven home to us in this project, which was, a, as you can see at the top, um, a computer building. Uh, designed in the early 80s, and we were asked by an insurance company to turn it into an office building, uh, add one floor, and uh, introduce, um, introduce daylight, uh, better conditions, and so on and so forth. And it was really uh, fantastic or really interesting because um, we, we managed to, uh, to keep the, the concrete structure. I mean, everything else had been... Uh, removed the facade, the, all the surface finishes, uh, all the equipment, everything uh, been removed, and just the concrete frames uh, stayed. And we we actually started to cut holes in, into the uh, into the floors in order to um, improve daylighting and ventilation and stuff like that. And uh, and uh, and then we would kind of put a new layer of equipment. You can see that in this photograph quite beautifully. It's kind of relatively rough. I mean. The, it was not meant to be exposed, but we deliberately exposed it. You can still see the scar of the cut here of the uh, floor that's been cut off, and, and we sandblasted the, um, the, the concrete, so it makes quite a, beautiful, it's quite a beautiful surface. And then we set against that, we set kind of the pristine um, uh, aesthetic of steelwork or aluminum work or whatever. Um, and. Um, it was very interesting, and at the end of the project, we asked our engineer, could he please tell us whether we saved energy by doing this? Um, and the, the, the outcome of the, arc of the calculation was really astounding for us, because what he calculated is that the energy that was, so to say, saved or not um, used, and the emission that was not emitted, is the equivalent of heating the building for 35 years. So, I mean, that kind of drove home to us that all the kind of equipment, all the kind of super clever facades, all the sort of cross ventilation of the world would never achieve anything of that kind of magnitude. 
um, and it became clear to us, uh, and we were maybe a little bit slow in picking this up, um, that the kind of adaptation of existing buildings is probably the most sustainable thing that you, um, that you can do. So, I mean, whenever you have the opportunity, the first choice should be to use uh, existing materials. And culturally speaking, that, of course, is also a tradition that we can uh, observe all over the place. I mean, buildings that have been adapted, that have been reused, they're reinterpreted, in, and then <coughs> it becomes most interesting when you still kind of find the traces of a different, like for example, in Syracuse and Sicily, a kind of Ionic, temp uh, not Ionic, a Doric temple that has been tur turned into a church, so have a Baroque facade, and you still have parts of the temple sticking out of the wall on the side, or the Forum Romanum, which was, for, uh, in Piranesi's illustration here, was used as a, a meadow for sheep for a while because Rome had kind of, the, the, the population had been reduced so much, or the famous Mesquita in Cordoba and contemporary examples, uh, an office building in Berlin that's being used, has been taken over by squats, if you like, and it's become a sort of cultural center or the famous uh, the Filipino uh, people who come on Sundays underneath the, in Hong Kong, underneath the Hong Kong Shanghai Bank by Norman Foster and kind of take this as a sort of social hotspot. Um, um, and wherever the opportunity arose, we have been trying to um, kind of benefit for, of existing situations. This is a kind of police station where we uh, use an existing um, a part of a building that's been bombed and uh, there's only a fragment left and we added this wing. So we were using the existing corridor. Um, here you can see that's the existing corridor and then we added rooms on, on, on one side, at least on two floors and it's a, it's a joint um, police and fire station for the government in, uh, in Berlin. And other projects that are more recent, this is a school and this is kind of particularly interesting because there's a certain political, I mean, in the kind of cultural, um, in the cultural uh, connotations, there's a certain political issue here in that this is a typical building of the GDR, the kind of East German um, uh, authorities. Uh, the uh, building industry was basically uh, totally industrialized and there's a, 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 a huge preference for prefabricated concrete construction. And um, buildings were designed in types, so there were residential types, a handful of like high-rise, low-rise, mid-rise, and so on. Uh, and the same went for schools. So this is uh, uh, school number 80. Uh, and uh, it was built at the, as a present for the people of Rostock to um, the people of East Berlin. And it's, uh, it has certain regional variations, which are uh, uh, for, the, for the kind of, so they're sort of subtle, they have certain pieces of cladding, but in general, they're, they're this, um, this, these typical um, buildings, which were, meant to, which were actually built all over the country. And <laughs> after reunification, a lot of these buildings were removed because there, were, there was a prejudice um, by Westerners mostly against these kind of products of the East. They technically have certain sort of issues, um, but uh, generally there's, in terms of spatial layout and so on, they're actually quite usable. And here was one of the rare examples of a kind of private initiative which bought the school and actually repaired it uh, carefully and used it. Uh, very successfully, and it had to be extended because the, it grew uh, beyond its um, the, the spatial uh, offer that was on hand. So we added this uh, little extension here, and then most of all the roof roof extension um, in in timber, uh, partially because timber is light, and this these uh, this the so-called plattenbau technology. It's, uh, it means that every everything's made out of uh, plates. So walls, floors, uh, everything is, is made of load-bearing plates. So it basically, it's very difficult to remove uh, individual walls because it immediately kind of affects the whole thing. And, uh, but we had a very good engineer who kind of worked out a kind of very clever scheme. And with the kind of relatively lightweight material timber, we could add um, two, two more floors on, onto this existing uh, structure. And, um, that, uh, well, is an, a, another project of an office building uh, that we turn into an, a residential building that's on site now. Um, uh, but I mean, the, 
the kind of use of, um, uh, of, of existing buildings is not just in terms of um, practicality, in terms of uh, carbon emission, in terms of all of these questions, quantitative um, uh, issues, uh, and, uh, a kind of good idea, but it also um, makes culturally makes cities richer and makes uh, adds to the adds to the quality of architecture in our view. Um, of course, um, timber I already mentioned is uh, a material that is. Um, probably best in terms of um, uh, carbon dioxide emission. So if you, if you cannot use an existing building, if you cannot do adaptation, then um, these materials, uh, timber and, uh, and uh, also clay, are um, uh, probably uh, best. And we started to more and more use timber as a material for various um, uh, building types, including this kind of little church. Um, <coughs> Uh, and, uh, we, we did it for cost reasons, really, to be totally honest. Um, we didn't quite uh, understand the sort of impact it also has on its uh, footprint until we did it. Um, but we did it for cost reasons because it basically is a raw construction. It doesn't have any finishes. And we just waxed the, the timber, and, and that was that. And so therefore, it was uh, much superior to, um, to concrete. Um, <coughs> This kind of experience with timber in, the, in that project, but also various other aspects, led us down another path, which made um, this whole idea of reuse and uh, cyclical, uh, ec uh, cyclical economy, cyclical ma materiality um, uh, uh, kind of interesting. We were invited to build a, um, a student's accommodation, and we decided to employ um, timber modular uh, uh, timber modules, basically, and make the whole thing uh, as a sort of table, if you like. You can see that very clearly at the top left image as a table of concrete, which um, offers uh, so undercroft uh, for bicycle parking, and uh, some of it is, has kind of uh, um, sort of social spaces, joint spaces, and then on top of it, there's a stack of up to seven um, units, which were um, they were built. Uh, this is the facade is kind of also um, designed in a sort of modular um, fashion. But I mean, these are very, very simple um, uh, rooms, which were all prepared in the factory and just stacked on top of each other, and just uh, services connected, water, and, uh, and so on and so forth, electricity. Very fast way of building, uh, very uh, efficient, very precise, um, and, uh, and obviously uh, great in its performance. Again, that's not a new idea. That there are kind of examples of the mid-century, mid in particular of prefab buildings that are sort of flat pack, like almost like an IKEA Billy uh, shelf that you, you kind of uh, is being brought by two lorries and you uh, put it all together in, in a few days and have a, a home. And then, of course, there is also in the 70s a kind of craze for modularity, if you like. But if, like, for example, the Habitat uh, project in Montreal by Moshe Safdi. But as far as I can work out, I mean, these were actually, um, well, not the Kurukawa, the tower. And that's unfortunately, has been just now been demolished. That is a kind of pure, true modular constructions. But the bottom and the top right, I, I don't think they are really modular because they are uh, too uh, sculptural, if you like, uh, in order to just allow for them, for units to be stacked and uh, kind of do their own load bearing. We, we had the opportunity to do another project in the same way, um, and that's uh, slightly more um, open. So you, you can see there's kind of frames. They're not, uh, they're not boxes anymore. And that allows you flexibility horizontally. And these, <coughs> these units, I mean, of course, with the, with the student housing, you can also imagine to take that apart and kind of turn it into something else at the end of its life. Uh, but with, particularly with these, which allow for more flexibility um, because of the, uh, you can put the walls wherever you like. Um, it's very, very easy to imagine that you would um, use them for a school or a kindergarten or for even a kind of residential building um, um, in, in a second or third or fourth life. So <clears throat> much as the buildings were kind of assembled as uh, individual uh, components, they can also be disassembled and rearranged into um, different uh, formations. 
Um, there's one, <coughs> I mean, apart from social sustainability that I kind of touched upon on, at the beginning, uh, there's also another aspect <coughs> which I think is, is important for us as architects. Um, obviously, the whole ecological movement, the whole idea of sustainability is about well-being. I mean, it's, it's, we're trying to safeguard the well-being of ourselves, but of particularly of future generations in the buildings that we are designing. And, and well-being is actually not necessarily a quantitative um, item. Well-being is subjective. I mean, whether you feel well in the space has a lot to do with your sensual perception of that space. In other words, what you're hearing, what you're seeing, how you, your sort of bodily situation, how it's scale, the environment, the acoustics, and so on, um, play a, a major role. And <clears throat> Uh, one of the kind of great successes, I think, of the space upstairs is that it has fantastic acoustics, and I think, therefore, it's a kind of very pleasant space to be in. It's partially to do with the materialities and partially to do with the light and everything else, but I think the fact that the acoustics are so good, I mean, makes a, a huge difference. So I, I think we are kind of called, as architects, we're called to um, respond and to stimulate um, the sensual perception that... Um, how people um, see their environment. Um, and this is just a, a, another project where we, where we kind of use the movement again um, as a particular, I mean, this is also working with color, as a particular condition of the site. It's in Paris, and you see there's a bridge. You come across the bridge, and you're walking centrally onto this building. And we responded to that by a kind of color coating that suggested a kind of curve. and picked up the symmetry. And then, as you move on, uh, you're actually moving out of, the, out of the axis and to the left, and then you have to turn right around the building. And so that, uh, that second movement we've reflected with a layer of um, vertical fins, which also acted as solar protection. But I mean, they're more like a sort of dynamic um, experience um, that uh, catches your eye. Um, as you kind of come around the corner, and this is now a view where you see the two layers actually um, working with each other. There are other views where you just see one or the other. Um, <coughs> the, the kind of facade of the building is a lot to do with this interface to the climate and you know, solar protection and whatever, ventilation, all of these things. But it also, of course, is the, the way the a building presents itself to the um, to the outside, to the city. So in a way, it's a lot to do with dress. It's like a, you know, like you're creating with, when, whenever you go, let's say you go to a wedding or something like that, you dress especially. You're creating the, the I mean, the occasion makes you wear something special, but you are wearing something special also creates the occasion. And <clears throat> similarly, uh, we think that architecture that in a way wears a special dress in particularly city situations that are maybe not so um, uh, charming to start off with, um, have the capacity to introduce a, total, a totally different spirit into a site. I mean, this is another example which is kind of clever in terms of ventilation and so on and so forth, but I'm also showing it really as a, as a kind of decorative layer, if you like, um, that is um, somehow uh, trying to affect the environment um, uh, it, it, it sits in. And here's finally, <laughs> I mean, this, uh, two days ago I was giving a short uh, lecture on color in, uh, at, in the M Pavilion, which is a very nice building, by the way. Uh, and that really would, should have been the end, uh, the end uh, project in that, uh, in that uh, lecture because it's a, it's a building that is colorful, but it's not because we're coating it with ceramics or glass or anything else. It's because it's uh, covered in highly reflective stainless steel and it's uh, reflecting its environment. So, I mean, that is, is a surface that is incredibly sensual. I mean, you want to go past and touch it because it's so, it seems so beautiful. And of course, it reflects the light um, every morning. 
lunchtime, evening in different ways and uh, in the seasons and so on and so forth. It kind of creates with a very simple effect uh, a kind of very beautiful, very sensual um, surface. So finally, <laughs> with all these kind of um, reflections of existing situations that we somehow have to find our way into and which we want to improve and, and add to and, and somehow um, enrich and make, uh, elevate, nobilitate culturally, we will have to accept that we will not looking at pure forms, but we are looking at combinations, agglomerations, accumulations of forms. And um, <clears throat> in this kind of thought, in this, um, uh, we felt very much um, at home in the logic of Japanese what's called wabi-sabi, which is, a, which is a, an aesthetic um, philosophy, if you like, which kind of finds the, the, the thing that is slightly broken, that is slightly different, that's slightly uh, not perfect, more beautiful than the, uh, the kind of perfect, simple form. And it's, this is kind of maybe most adequately uh, uh, celebrated in these objects, which are called kintsugi, that's a, a, a ceramic a bowl that's bro has been that has been broken, and in order to repair it, um, the craftsperson used gold and kind of turned the, um, the, the, the 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 scar, as it were, into a special feature, into its special um, uh, architectural or aesthetic quality. So. Uh, examples by Alba Alto, this was like a test building really, but I mean it ended up being this kind of uh, motley kind of thing of various materialities or a Picciades flowing in the Acropolis, it sort of so, so beautifully kind of blends into these uh, historic kind of situations, uh, seem great inspirations for us. Um, so I think that's it, sorry, it's still been a bit of a tour de force. I've been trying to um, sum up these complicated kind of thoughts and associations into nine, um, uh, say, uh, Corbusier would have called it a, a sort of uh, letters to, to the Monsieur Architect, <laughs> so a little bit an inspiration particularly for the students. Um, one is supposed to have five points of architecture, I think, so I'm still working at it. <laughs> it might change over the next uh, periods, but it's a start uh, in kind of trying to reflect the situation that we are faced with, with climate change and the kind of changing conditions of our world. Thank you very much. <laughs>
cash you one huge favour. Absolutely. Um, can you just help me with the... This one? Leave it for me. Oh, really? Yeah. Do you have a case? Make sure that I've got a box here. Now you can get going, Joel. Where's your box? Just around the corner. Upstairs? Yeah. No, no, just around the corner. I can manage. All good. All good. No, I don't. You sure?